Evet. Ee, dear guest and dear participants, uh, I would like to welcome to the second of the Arva Anatolian lecture series. Today we will talk and discuss an interdisciplinary subject with you. Archaeology is one of the main tasks of the which is to the reconstruct past societies is perhaps, perhaps one of one the most appropriate branches of science for the interdisciplinary work. Therefore, archaeological projects are always in contact with different fields of science. One of them field is uh, zoology. We desperately need this field in the archaeology in order to understand the animal and human relationships. Our speaker today, Dr. Abu Bekir Sıddık, is a researcher who was worked and concentrated on animal-human relations for a long time. He has also been a member of our excavation team for a long time and has been working very successfully and productively as the archaeologist of the INS excavation team. Now, uh, let's get to know him a little better. Dr. Abu Bekir Sıddık is a Bangladesh-born Turkish archaeologist specialist on the faunal remains and ethnography. He was born in 1984 in a Madaripur, Bangladesh. He obtained in his BA honors and MA in archaeology at Jagan Girnagar University in Bangladesh. He completed his PhD at the Department of Prehistory Archaeology Division, Istanbul University, defending the thesis on human animal environment interactions in pre pottery Neolithic fauna in Central Anatolia. Currently, Dr. Siddiq is an associated professor at the Department of Archaeology, Mardin Artuklu University in Turkey. At present, he conducting zooarchaeological research at various archaeological projects in Turkey, including the Neolithic sites of Kürtük Tepe, Cemkahöyük, Arvet Suvan Tepe, and Sefer Tepe in southeastern Anatolia. Calculatic sites such as Kalnıtaşhöyük in central Turkey and Ikistepe Höyük in northern Turkey Iron Age sites, including Bayraklı Höyük in western Turkey, Eyl fortresses in southeastern Turkey, uh, Alaybeyi Höyük, uh, and Ayenis Stadel in Eastern Turkey. Medieval sites such as Hasanke fortresses and Mardin fortresses excavations in Southeastern Turkey. In a uh, few years ago, Dr. Siddiq was the first to introduce the dis disciplinary anthrozoology, the systematic field of studying animal human interaction in Turkey. So far, he has authored four books and over 30 scientific papers ranging from early Neolithic uh, to the Ottoman Empire period. His research mostly focused on anthropocentrism and animal-human environment interactions through the time. After this introduction, I will, uh, I will uh, before giving the word to Bekir, uh, Dr. Bekir Siddiq, I would like the introduction for very shortly in Turkish. Please let me time. Ee, biraz önce e, arkadaşlar İngilizce olarak kısaca sunumunu yapmaya çalıştığım e, bugünkü konuşmayla ilgili kısa bilgiyi de size aktarmak istiyorum. Türkiye'li katılımcılarımız için. E, bu e, günkü konuşmacımız Abu Bekir Sıddık. E, kendisi arkeozooloji üzerine çalışıyor ve insan hayvan ilişkileri üzerine uzun zamandır çalışmaları devam ediyor. Kendisi Bangladeş doğumlu, 1984 yılında doğum, doğum Bangladeş'te. Daha sonra yine lisans ve yüksek lisansını Bangladeş'teki Jahan Girganagar doğru mu söylüyorum? Abu bilmiyorum. Telaffuzun doğru mu? Jahan Girganagar Üniversitesi'nde yapıyor. Daha sonra 
İstanbul Üniversitesi Prehistoria'da doktorasını tamamladıktan sonra daha çok e, Neolitik öncesi dönem üzerinde hayvan insan ilişkileri üzerine ve arkeozoolojik zoolojik araştırmalar yapıyor. Bugün de birçok projede devam ediyor çalışmaları. Körtük Tepe, e, Sefer Tepe, e, Kanlı Taş Hüyük, İkiz Tepe, e, Bayraklı Hüyük, e, onun dışında Alay Beyi Hüyük ve bizim Ayenis Kanesinde ve Hasan Keyfte de bu şekilde arkeozoolojik çalışmaları devam ettiriyor ve kendisi bu anlamda Erken Neolitik'ten Osmanlı İmparatorluğu'na kadar çok geniş bir zaman silsilesi içerisinde antrozooloji disiplini bağlamında insan, hayvan ve çevre ilişkilerini irdeleyen bir alanda uzmanlığını devam ettirmeye çalışıyor. Aynı zamanda kendisi dediğimiz gibi bizim Ayenis Kalesi kazılarında da arkeozoolog olarak çalışmalarını devam ettiriyor. Ben şimdi sözü... Abu Bekir Hoca'ya, Doktor Abu Bekir Sıddık Hoca'ya vermek istiyorum. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to the introduction. Yes, uh, Abu, we are listening to you. So I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, right. okay. Your, we can see the, your, your screen. Okay, so you do you see the full screen? Thank you, uh, Professor Ishikli, for yeah. for for for the introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me for for the lecture. So, as you can see from the title, this uh, lecture is a general uh, topic: the importance, the potential of zooarchaeology in Eastern Turkey. So I've been working in Eastern Turkey since 2016. So it's been six years, only six years I'm working in this area. So in these six, uh, six years of study, it's not uh, that easy to understand the archeology span and the zooarchaeology in general in a vast area, Eastern Turkey, because Eastern Turkey is uh, one of the largest uh, region in, in Turkey. And in the following section, you will see from the uh, uh, lecture that a lot of archaeological research have been uh, being conducted and also have been done in previous years in Turkey, in Eastern Turkey. Uh, so in normal uh, normal sense, when we um, want to understand the importance uh, of the region uh, or the archaeology of the region in particular, so if we uh, we have to uh, we uh, see the geographical context and environmental context of the of the region so uh, if uh, we see the ge geographical situation um, uh, in general so uh, uh, eastern turkey is uh, by the name is the easternmost part of present day turkey uh, in anatolia uh, eastern part of the anatolia and uh, a part of this region is uh, connected to um, uh, Mesopotamia. I mean, that is southeastern Turkey. And part of the region is connected to Iran, Iraq, and also in upper uh, eastern part is Azerbaijan, Armenian Highland. Uh, in general, this region is highly mountainous. So. I mean, in Turkey, Turkey is also in generally mountainous, but Eastern Turkey is is the uh, most mountainous. Uh, it has most mountainous topography, and because of the uh, because of the Caucasus, uh, extreme cold. Uh, so at one time you have the mountainous uh, topography, and another time you have uh, colder, longer winter. And severe colder climate. So, with with this condition, um, for historically, Eastern Turkey is not that popular or suitable for agricultural practice. So, uh, it, normally, uh, when you see like in in this one region, uh, Lake Van Basin area, you have some uh, plain land. And also uh, in Kars region, you have some 
uh, uh, some plain land in air room region, you have air room and passenger plane, and also in LRG region, you have some plain land. So only this, uh, except for the for only these few plain land, you, uh, Eastern Turkey, uh, like chillable land for agricultural land is very, very scarce. Uh, that's why until today, um, only 10% of whole Eastern Turkey uh, is suitable for agriculture. So, so that's why uh, in Southeastern Turkey, when uh, like um, uh, origin of uh, Southeastern Turkey was one of the a very neighboring region, uh, sedentary life, uh, uh, sedentary, sedentary life, and, and also farming wasn't introduced, wasn't available uh, in Eastern Turkey until the late Chalcolithic, it means like about 3,000, 4,000 years later. So the, the main region for this is the topography. Uh, uh, there are and suitable landscape, uh, topographical uh, situation, uh, topographical um, condition for agriculture, and also uh, winter. So, for example, this is a general picture uh, of eastern Turkey during the winter time. So, when you see in southeastern Turkey, it's not like it's cold, but it's not like under snow cover, but uh, eastern Turkey is completely under snow cover because of the high plateau, uh, higher elevation, and also because of the winter cold coming from uh, Caucasus region. So that's why this region actually uh, was, uh, was, was not popular for early agricultural people. Evidence uh, uh, also says uh, like Eastern Turkey also still today, we don't find early Neolithic and also Neolithic site uh, in this region yet. So uh, normally archeologically, archeological sites in this region like uh, became a sedentary sites village. Uh, so evident, is evident from uh, Chalcolithic period when we see a lot of urbanization in uh, in this area in southeastern Turkey in um, upper Syria and and and and also central Turkey we see but and from from from this time we see like um, sedentary people sedentary village uh, starting uh, in eastern Turkey so uh, still from from that period every every every period uh, from Calcolithic. Bronze Age, Iron Age, and also from later period, as uh, the geographical condition and topographical condition is not favorable for agriculture, people are uh, both sedentary or um, uh, both sedentary people or um, uh, mobile people. Everybody, I mean, all people heavily dependent on animal raising animals. So. Uh, in particular, uh, like in Hakari, uh, this region, people are uh, mostly dependent on uh, goat and sheep, sheep and goat, and particularly in Kar, where you have a lot of uh, plain land, and also in Erzu region, are people were mostly dependent on cattle. raising animals, uh, mostly cattle and sheep. But uh, uh, like in recent years and also uh, particularly from uh, uh, like Iron Age, so uh, uh, um, important parts of the animal um, uh, actually were, uh, comprised from goats. Uh, uh, discuss uh, this um, um, condition so we see a, a, a geographical region 
where you don't uh, have human settlement from from the earliest Neolithic period. One, still, I mean, even though you, your neighboring region is uh, uh, like very favorable and a lot of human settlements from uh, from Neolithic onwards, uh, because only a geographical and unfavorable unfavorable uh, land use and also severe climate condition. Uh, but from from Calcolithic period, when people started to occupy this land, or when it start, people started to started to leave, I mean, uh, and also uh, dense population mm, arrived in this uh, region. So uh, definitely, people had to depend on animals. So still, um, uh, until thirty years, uh, I mean, in recent history also, in recent past also. Southeastern uh, Eastern Turkey was heavily dependent on animal force, uh, like uh, people people for their transport, for their uh, small scale irrigate, uh, uh, cultivation, or uh, for daily life, for carrying water, or also harvesting from horticulture products. Uh, people are. Um, heavily dependent on mm, like uh, horse donkeys and like uh, in I, I i was doing ethnographic research in uh, air room and then there people said like yeah we don't have now cattle cattle car cattle car but uh, even 30 years ago uh, people in air room they were um, i mean in rural people they were mostly depending on cattle cattle cattle car so uh, so, so evidently, um, when uh, a geographical condition is not um, agricultural based, people are based uh, depending on animal and uh, an, uh, raising animals and pastoralism. Definitely, um, uh, definitely, uh, uh, uh, when we do archaeological research, any, I mean, the question of animal pastoralism, animal economy, and contribution of animal is uh, beca become like more important in this region. So uh, when we see archaeological research in this region, Eastern Turkey, we see like uh, archaeological research started uh, like, um, uh, during the Ottoman period in 18... 1870s like this in that time also when uh, there were like uh, discovery of uh, ancient cities like troy or in central turkey uh, yeah in black sea region central central turkey region like you have hitted uh, air, uh, hitted uh, uh, hitted cities and in the same time also uh, like in uh, in uh, uh, ban region so there were excavations like uh, at Toprakale, like this kind of excavation we see. Uh, but uh, uh, in Eastern Turkey, systematic archaeology or like what we see in modern like uh, disciplinary archaeology actually became popular during uh, 70s um, uh, when uh, in Malatya Elazi region, there was a dam project, Keban dam project. So in that time, there were uh, about, uh, like a, a number of uh, important sites and also like about uh, about 20 30 sites were excavated in this area at a time a period time period of like tw uh, 10 5 10 years and also some other projects uh, we see in Erzurum cast region mostly uh, during 80s and also during 70s and also in Van region also uh, still also there are ongoing projects, uh, but mostly on uh, uh, Urartian sites. So if we see uh, uh, excavated sites uh, in Eastern Turkey, we see a lot of uh, uh, about 20 prehistoric sites. Uh, and some of them are from Paleolithic, uh, uh, uh, are Paleolithic sites, but uh, in these Paleolithic sites, we don't see any faunal remains discovered, only stones and other materials. But 
from uh, Neolithic, a, a number of Neolithic sites like in Jaferhuk. This is also like in a border area of um, eastern and southeastern Turkey. But um, uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, animal remains are uh, unearthed from these sites. And also we see uh, like zoological reports uh, being published from these sites. And uh, as you say, from uh, prehistoric uh, mm, uh, Eastern Turkey, like uh, from Calculitic sites, uh, about 20, 20 to 25 uh, sites were excavated. But we see like Uh, at two, three sites, uh, like Zuarkul. Abu, I think there is a, some problem on your internet. Ex excavated? Uh, hello? Uh, sorry, but uh, sometimes uh, your uh, voice, uh, we cannot hear. Very well. I think some problem internet. Do you hear me now? Now, yeah, yes, we are. Uh, we can hear now. Please go on. Thank you. So, uh, particularly, uh, most uh, excavated sites in eastern Turkey are proto-historic proto sites. Many are like occupied from late Calcolithic Bronze Age up to Iron Age. And, and, and as you say, about seven, 60 to 70 sites have been excavated, small scale, large scale, in total, about 60 to 70 sites have been excavated in Eastern Turkey. And as you see, only a handful sites, we see Zuarkil's report from a handful of handful sites. Like uh, in data from K1 project, Korudik Tepe, Northern Tepe, and also Ashwan Kale. So here there were some like prominent zoarchaeologists working, uh, uh, like uh, Joshim, Joshim uh, Bodnek and also uh, Sebastian Pine. They also work in this area 19, during 1970s. And like only one site, Arslan Tepe, this is also kind of Eastern and Southeastern Turkey's borderland. And still also this project is going on. And zoarchaeologist is a like uh, continuous or a permanent, uh, uh, they are permanently working as a, a team in this area. So continuously you have a team, a zoarchaeologist in this archaeological team. But in other uh, sites, we don't see like uh, there are like, uh, Sos Hoyuk. So it was also like a kind of um, rescue excavation and also Alaybe Hoyuk, like also one or two two years of rescue excavations. And there you see like Zwar Physical Report uh, been published, but other sites uh, still we don't see, uh, as, but as, uh, sometimes randomly uh, there are information that animal bones, and definitely this is obvious that a lot of animal bones should be unearthed from this site, but but we don't see any zoarchaeological reports from this site yet. And also like in uh, Van region, uh, mostly Iron Age sites, um, but these uh, a lot a number of sites were occupied from Bronze Age, but later like uh, you see a lot of um, uh, Urartian sites also. But here also like, some of the excavations were like for long period, some were like for short period, but we don't see a zoarchaeological report from most of the sites. So, um, uh, but um, I'd like to give a case study here uh, to like demonstrate like if uh, this uh, huge number of sites, like over a hundred, over about a hundred sites uh, been excavated in this site in this uh, eastern Turkey. Uh, but uh, systematic zoarchaeology can uh, how systematic zoarchaeology can like give us like really really fascinating answers for archaeological questions. So in this sense, I I had chance to work in eastern Turkey on two sites, mainly on Alaybe Hoyuk, and another is as Professor Ifikli 
um, uh, mentioned before, Ionis Kalisi. I'm still working on Ionis. So I'll, I'd like to, in a, like in a, like 10, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, I'd like to demonstrate uh, a case study as ionist, like how zooarchaeology can be potential in the archaeological research in Eastern Turkey. So ionist, uh, uh, so this is also uh, ionist in the later, uh, established in the, the late, later period of Urartian period. So here is Tushbach, a uh, present day uh, Van, Van Kale, the capital of um, Urartian period. So after uh, about 30 kilometers away um, in the later period, like 6th century uh, BC, the site was established by Rusa, the son of Argishti. So he was the last uh, powerful king. So in, in his period, he, he uh, built a, lot, uh, a number of uh, uh, city, uh, citadel city, fortress city, and Ionis was one of them. And like Kef Kale also was built by by during his reign. So in Ionis, in there was excavations for about thirty years, and in that thirty years of excavation, this Ionis citadel, uh, like uh, they found animal bones, but very very uh, uh, scattered not uh, uh, accumulation or like the uh, good assemblage of animal bones. Uh, they, uh, there were animal bones in outer, uh, outer city, but uh, in, in, in the citadel during the 30 years of excavation, there weren't like animal bone remains. So, uh, so there were, I mean, there were like kind of uh, a lot of confusion, a lot, a lot of, uh, mystery and also questions about like what was the function of this uh, function of this citadel what was the role of the, the, the this is the central uh, this is the temple the role of the temple or well, how what was the life and also subsistence of of these people here but in uh, 2014 the excavation team uh, uh, unearthed a, uh, a maiden deposit here in this area uh, and full of animal bones there. And in 2014 and 15, uh, they unearthed um, about, about 30,000 pieces of bones and, and their fragments. And I, I was fortunate, I was fortunate um, uh, by the invitation of uh, Professor Ishikli. So I started to study there from 2016. And, and as you see, uh, th this is a huge uh, citadel, and this is the temple complex, very big temple complex. And then here there were royal residents, and this, in this area you have uh, there were uh, like storage buildings, a lot of uh, storage, uh, a lot of rooms. But uh, here, uh, like in the like northern slope of the residence buildings, uh, there were uh, like this uh, deposit. Uh, this bone bone deposit. So what I did, I I studied like for five years. I systematically studied the bone remains, and uh, in particular, uh, we found like uh, four, uh, three uh, three types of livestock uh, dominant uh, in this area. Mostly, we found. Uh, um, uh, sorry. So mostly we found sheep, and then we found uh, cattle, and then we found goat remains. Uh, I will I'll go uh, part by part of these things. But if we, so, so when we see the animal bones, so just uh, plainly, yeah, I can evaluate, okay, this much bones, this much animals, this is the percentage, this is the percentage. But uh, this is not the uh, fact. Uh, why I'm bringing these case studies. Because uh, we found animal bones here in this area. And you see in the very big citadel, there are like here is a temple complex, very big complex, uh, temple co complex. And also here residential area, a lot of rooms and buildings. And then you see a lot of 
rooms that is that was storage like so and also here some other rooms related to this temple complex and then gates gates so so so apparently there were a lot of uh movements in this site a lot of activities but what is the relationship with the bones here uh, with this citadel so finding these bones yeah like yeah in i and in iron citadel you have uh 70 percent sheep a 10 percent goat and five percent ten percent uh cattle so like if i publish like this way or if i present the report this way there isn't any meaning of the archaeological site here, uh, except just yeah maybe people were uh, people use these animals for their sub uh, for their for their food or economical source and other things. But uh, when uh, when we see archaeological context, when we add archaeological context with these bone remains, then uh, we can solve. Uh, some of the unsolved questions, un uh, unanswered questions here, we can find really, really critical findings here. So I'll go uh, part by part uh, with this. So we see like this, uh, uh, that area was like uh, about uh, like uh, 10, uh, 20 meters uh, long thick deposit and about 15 meters wide deposit and also about like 1.5 meter thick deposit. So this uh, deposit uh, also not only animal bones, uh, there were other cultural materials, uh, particularly pot shards. But uh, the density of pot shards was uh, like lower, uh, like animal bones were higher. Like if you find five animal bones, then you find only one pot shard, like this way, like ratio. And in, with, in this deposit, uh, there were other cultural artifacts. So one was like an armor, bone armor. So it's like kind of symbolic, not not for you know regular fighting use. So it's a kind of a souvenir, like uh, an armor made by bone. And also uh, some uh, iron objects, uh, like a spearhead, uh, uh, sorry, projectile points, arrowhead, and also like nails and also buttons and also like bula uh, a number of bula so with uh, royal royal seals so uh, uh, when we um, see the function of these uh, objects so these uh, i mean in in in one sense you have portrait but at, at that time you you find other objects uh, valuable objects, not ordinary objects, not like uh, for common people's objects. So you find objects for used by at, at least higher class people like bulla with royal seal and also seal stump, uh, stump seals, and also mm, like uh, like uh, precious uh, uh, uh, button made of precious stones. So uh, with this context, um, it's apparent like uh, this area wasn't like, uh, or the accumulation of bones wasn't like uh, uh, the activity of an ordinary people or ordinary function. So, so it was kind of yeah like discarded things, discarded objects, but also produced by uh, like higher class people. So, at a citadel context, uh, it's apparently uh, was a royal context. So that's why we named this area as a royal median. So in this area, so after studying the animal bones, so I have studied so far about 10,000 bones and their fragments. So still the study is uh, uh, ongoing still. So yeah, in the future, there will be uh, uh, many more um, results, uh, more results. But for now, so I've studied about uh, 10,000, over 10,000 bones and, and their fragments. So. Out of these 10,000 bones, about 4,000 bones were used for analytical purposes because um, so you have ribs and also you have uh, uh, vertebra. So we don't count these vertebra. We don't count these vertebra because of the because uh, you cannot identify uh, exactly identify uh, like which animals is it because uh, the vertebra of a deer or vertebra of a goat can be similar sometimes. And uh, for example, the ribs of a goat on ribs of a sheep can be 
uh, almost similar. So it's, it's too difficult to, uh, to understand which uh, species is it. So that's why normally in zooarchaeological research, we don't, um, sometimes we count them as I counted here, but we don't uh, count them for analytical purposes. So out of 10,000 bones, so about 4,000, uh, over 4,000 bones were selected for analytical purposes. So for analysis, so we see about uh, uh, over 40, 40, 40% 40 uh, is sheep, 5% is goat, but some un un unidentified sheep and goat, so 30. So in total, about 80% of the bones were from sheep or goat. So like comparing to sheep or goat, it's uh, like uh, about nine, like nine to one was sheep. So yeah, people uh, exploited, people used uh, or killed sheep uh, the, at a higher frequency there. But we also see about 15% uh, bones uh, came from uh, cattle and also some other wild animals. Uh, from, from sheep, uh, as you see, like from all body parts, so from um, in sheep rib bones, we found from all body parts, from head to toe, uh, head to hoof, uh, all, kind, all body parts were present. And uh, in particular, um, non-meat bearing bones, uh, particularly, like uh, mandible and for, uh, uh, like um, phalanges, like uh, hoof bones, and also like some other bones, like we see uh, uh, like uh, here scapula, this kind of bones. So we, these kind of uh, bones, non meat bearing bones normally when you slaughter an animal outside or somewhere, so what do you see? you just collect the meat and then you throw out the non-meat bearing bone. But in this case, when we find this kind of bones in higher rate, so it apparently these animals were slaughtered, were killed uh, on site, I mean, inside the castle, inside the citadel. And then after using, it was discarded in the midden. And when we also, uh, I also um, counted the age from these uh, bones. So, for example, when uh, when a sheep is um, is born, all bones is uh, like bone parts or cap is unfused. But at a certain period of time, uh, the the cap the bone the cap is fused. So, for example, um, uh, uh, the the upper cap of a of a uh, phalanx is fused when it's like one year old, or maybe when a sheep is six year, uh, year six year old or five to six year old, then it's uh, like uh, the humerus, the right arm, the upper cap is fused only. So unless until it's fused, so it's uh, we can see it's not like six years, like say so so. Based on this epiphyseal fusion of these bones, uh, we I calculated the age of the uh, age ratio of the uh, sheep bones at the site. So in total, about one thousand bones actually was possible uh, to calculate the age. And according to the uh, age uh, result, age data, we see like the highest number of uh, like you see, the the sheep mostly they were not young; they were like one year, and also, you know. Uh, Abu, <coughs> sorry, but your uh, share screen is finished. Please, let's try yeah, again. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm adding again. Yes, please. So uh, sorry for this. I don't know what's uh, what's going on. It's like I didn't do anything. Suddenly it's like gone. I'm sorry for this. So we see like uh, the the higher number of uh, bones or animals were like more than like one year, two years old. So it means uh, like these these animals were like selectively like 
butchered, selectively killed. So, so if you if you think about like uh, when you raise animals, maybe like at, at uh, in inside the citadel, so it doesn't mean like uh, uh, so because people don't eat like three year old, four year old sheep, and also if you think about royal people, so they don't eat like this kind of people because it's not tasty. So the best uh, uh, the best time to eat a uh, sheep is uh, like when it's like one year old or six months to one year old. So this is the most delicious meat. But when we see like the higher number of sheep is like this, so it means uh, apparently like these animals were like selectively collected and or given. So when you like kind of like tax, when you collect this uh, animal as a tax, so you collect an animal. So because you collect like from a from a farmer or from a herder, you collect like you have to give five animals for tax. So taxpayer and tax collector they collect the best animals, good animals. So so that yeah you can have more amount of meat. So uh, uh, as in the same way, uh, like there is also another way to um, calculate the age, like kind of so dental eruption so when when when an animal is born so you know we have like milk it and after like two years three years or uh, sorry after two months three months so this milk it is uh, slowly slowly is uh, like uh, uh, replaced by the permanent teeth so so for for for for, for uh, premolar so this is like kind of six months and then for permanent first molar. So you have like when you have one year, so it's, uh, it's, got, it's established. So like same way, uh, when, when you see like second molar or third molar, when they are like, we have like estimation way, like yeah, if this bone is uh, where this much, so, because at a certain case, a uh, certain age, this this this teeth is getting eroded, getting wear. So, by this eruption and wear rate of certain mandibula and certain uh, teeth, so it's also possible to calculate the age of animals. So, in total, also in sheep, so there was uh, about uh, like two hundred seventy-five specimens. Uh, so it was possible to estimate their age and also in the so this is uh, uh, important to check because when you uh, make the a estimation of age from the fusion of bone fusion so it can be uh, sometimes a bone can be missing so so when you calculate the age from also mandibula so then you have a chance to cross check like yeah the the the data is authentic age data is authentic here is also we see like the higher number of uh, uh, bones or individuals came from like from one year to four or five years so uh, sorry four years so it means so again like same hypothesis uh, so sorry same evidence like yeah so mostly at, at, at this citadel the sheep were mostly like uh, sub adult and adult individuals. So they were collected from outside. And when we uh, estimated the size of the sheep, we see like even most of the sheep were uh, bigger, larger than, than common standard size. Standard size, so here a standard size was used as a, as, as, as a wild sheep collected from um uh wild sheep collect, collected from central turkey uh, central turkey so as you see at ionis the the sheep they are older age and at a the time they are in their size they are larger than wild sheep so it means again this is also testifies that the tax collector or mm, the people at the site, they collected or they brought the sheep selectively, the bigger one and the, and, and the older one with higher, uh, uh, higher amount of meat. 
but uh, yeah, that we have like uh, also, as I said, in previous data sets, we have also a small uh, size ship also as well. And when we see the male and female ratio of the sheep, we see like higher number of individual were female. And similarly in, in goat also, like we see all kind of body parts. It means they were slaughtered the site. And also we see the age of this uh, animal. They are like older and like sour adult and adult individuals. And also their dental eruption and wear also says like they're older individuals again. And also, but when we see the size of the sheep and we compared it from uh, with a wild goat uh, collected from Northern Iran, and we see it's a little bit smaller than the wild goat. And when we see the sex ratio, we see like half of the female, half are male. So it means male, female. Yeah. And in the same time, like, sorry. Yeah. So when we see the uh, ratio of the uh, cattle, like the cattle also, like we see like the cattle were like higher. Uh, the age age was like older individual, not small, a uh, lot young individual. It was, they were older individuals. individuals. And also their um, dental eruption also says like they, these were older individuals. And also when we see their size, they were really, really very big, enormous. So it was compared by a, um, a modern cattle from Austria. So this, this cattle is really, really, the at ionists were bigger. And also for their male-female ratio, Again, we see in cattle, females are dominant by dominant over uh, males. And with this, uh, like three livestock data, like their age, their, uh, their sex and their size. And also we see like kind of pathological marks. And we see like some of these cattle, they were used as labor animals uh, by their traction. So with this, with this, um, with this uh, information, just only these three, type, three types of general uh, livestock, we see like this is a citadel and you have a very enormous and also enigmatic temple complex here. And you have royal residence here and you have a storage area and you have a bone accumulation, bone median in this area. And in this, Born, we see higher number of sheep and then a lot of cattle and then we see goat and we see these animals except for the goat were larger than other uh, common i mean normal uh, standard individuals and also we see these were older individuals and also we see uh, female were most dominant so if we ask the question like, yeah, what was the purpose of these bones? Were they sacrificed here? Could be. This is highly likely. But when we when we discuss this issue, like, yeah, if they sacrificed this, why they sacrificed more, more female than male? The question comes. And also when we like see like, uh, uh, yeah, because this is an ironist site and also Urartian site. And when we see the uh, religious text writings oblig uh, in uh, Urartian re uh, region, we see like uh, Meherkapi, there, there's a list of uh, uh, like animals should be sacrificed for like God and goddesses. So here the first prominent God is, was like Haldi. And then this temple was also founded, established in the name of Haldi. And in that list also there, like it was ordered, like for Haldi, you have to sacrifice this much of sheep. So like, yeah, prominently the sheep was like kind of, yeah, pre uh, preferred here. But at the time, the question is like, why like you have to slaughter female individuals more? Uh, or so, so was, was the uh, female individual was 
uh, sacrificed uh, like uh, selectively or like RAM was uh, sacrificed. So like these questions we can, uh, I mean, comes after, after when we discuss about the context. And also like, yeah, so here you find the bone accumulation from this side here. Uh, if, I mean, close to the royal residence. So, so was it like for consumption practice by the royal residence? So, if they were, if the the if these uh, bones were for, I mean, because of consumption, uh, consumption waste. So, why not uh, all? I mean, because we see uh, like young individuals, young animals. So, yeah. So, these were could be this this could be for consumption practice, but. Why not all uh, or most of the bones from uh, young individuals? Why larger individuals? So here, like archaeologically, here archaeological objects and also archaeological material. Uh, uh, I mean artifacts and also other cultural debris and also like the contextual position of the site and also contextual position and function of the temple. So in all together, uh, so we can uh, uh, solve the questions uh, of the uh, questions related to these bonds. So primarily, so some questions actually, conclusive questions actually came after the primary analysis of these livestock in uh, at Ionis. So one was like, yeah, it could be, uh, so we, we could um, like, so for example, here, uh, there are some questions um, like in Urartian uh, period or in, in general, in we, we see in Bastam, so Bastam is also another site related, uh, founded by uh, uh, Rusa, who also founded Ayanis. And in and ba Bastam, we see in citadel area, there wasn't any pig bones. So in Ayanis also, at Ayanis also, we don't see not a single pig bones there. And also uh, we see like a little bit ago, I, I just mentioned like, we see larger animals, older animals. So then we can like, yeah, if there isn't any kind of regular sacrifice or regular rituals related to animals, at least these larger individuals and also selective animals, they can be the result of irregular or occasional sacrifice at the site. And also, like, as I said, like these animals were not raised by the people at the citadel, for sure. But these animals definitely were, were collected from outside, mostly as tax animals. And when you see the tax animals, so for example, the harder, they don't, they don't give you, they don't give you the best animals. So for example, some animals, they have like, you know, pathological things and other marks. So you just give it as a tax and the taxpayer, uh, tax collector, they collect these animals and then very selective individuals were used for uh, the citadel. And as there, there was in Boston also, in, and also similarly that it, it is also supporting by, by Ionis, like there isn't any single pig bones at Ionis. So why not? Because uh, we see, I mean, in the following section, we will discuss these issues a little bit, I mean, in general in Eastern Turkey. But as you see, we see like there are there were pig bones in the lower town of uh, Ionis. In the same way, uh, there were also pig bones in the lower town of Bastam in Iran. But in royal uh, area, the citadel area, there wasn't any pig bones. So, could it be uh, that the royal people intentionally didn't consume or didn't sacrifice any pig? And the same way in ritual catalog or list of the animals catalog, we see uh, in 
like in Urartu and religion, pigs were not like part of the sacrificial animal. So could it be uh, pigs were taboo for Urartian royals or elite society or religious people? And because of this, can it can we say like yes, the citadel people they they were strictly following religious code like this kind of information without like written text is really really difficult to find the answer from archaeological materials but in this case these animal these phonal remains from this context actually give us kind of scopes to answer or analyze this kind of questions but when we see zoological research in Eastern Turkey in general, like I showed you the list of the sites in the region, we see only in Aslan Tepe, they have analytical research and elaborative research. And also we found like in Soshoyuk, there is also a PhD and also some analytical research there. And at Alaybe Huyuk, I try to do, and also it's also ongoing work, and also now at IANIS. But some, some, except for these sites, only a few sites they published reports. So like see, like these sites, like uh, in and in Van region in Van Kale, and also like um, Altin Tepe. So there are um, like zoological report, like, yeah, this much bones, like 5,000 5, bones, 5% 5 is sheep, 5% 5 is goat, but no archeological contextual analysis. And analytical research only a handful of sites we see like out of 100 sites, we see only a handful of sites doing analytical research and only one or two sites, like broader questions on regional or broader area, we see only one or two sites actually presented zooarchaeological report. But I just showed like three livestock in Ionis. And then in three livestock, we see like major archaeological questions like was peak taboo in Urartuan people? Like these are serious questions. Or what was the role of tax animals in Urartuan economy? Archaeological evidence. Or what was the actual, yeah, we see that we see the list of sacrificial animals that was really, really uh, important aspects for Urartian religion, Urartian economy, Urartian political change and other aspects or foundation or like big temple complex and other things. But what was actually the functional aspects, what was actually real scenario of animal sacrifice at Urartian, Urartian culture, for example. So only like, like three livestock, the ratio and their size, their sex, their their age, and also their archaeological context actually opens windows to answer these kind of crucial questions. What cannot be solved for like 30 years, 20 years, like still also under in debate, what was the real function of these sites? So except for these questions also, we see from INS, there are some other. So, for example, in Ionis assemblies, we see a lot of nasal bones that is very unlikely in other sites. Uh, we didn't report it yet. A lot of nasal bones we see at in Ionis assemblies. And also, we see a lot of tongue bones. So, animal. So, you have hyoid bones. In hyoid bones, the part of tongue bones. So, it's a yeah, I have studied a uh, number of other sites in, in Eastern Turkey and also other part of Turkey and I've, I've read reports and other things, but I didn't encounter this much tongue bones in, in this site. 
uh, in, in, the, in those sites. And also a uh, large accumulation of whole like body parts, including vertebra and ribs. And also, um, so as you said, like these complete finger bones, so a lot of, so these were like, yeah, they, these animals were butchered and also uh, on site and then discarded like huge piles. And as I discussed before, so the, out of 10,000 bones, there wasn't any single pig bones. And also only one dog bones, there wasn't any cut marks in that dog bones. But we see at Alai Beihu, this is also Ionic site, contemporary like 500 years older, younger period of Ionic. But in other region, like in Azurum region, we see like pig, raising pigs at Alai Bay. So it's important uh, part of the assemblage was, was pig. And also we see dogs, they were uh, like cut marks on dog bones. So people, so it was proved that people consume dog, dog bones. So uh, people consume dog meat there also. But at Ionis, so we don't see pig. But as I said, in outer town or ordinary people's life, we see pigs. At Ionis, only one bo uh, dog bone. So uh, in the early slides, like as you said, in present, present day also, like horse, donkeys, these are, they are very vital for survival. Uh, in this region, but at Ionis, we don't see uh, horse or donkey bones, only one donkey bones out of the 10,000 bones, but you see a lot of gnawing marks here, most likely beaten by dogs. So it's likely that this bone actually was later brought by a dog or discarded at the site, not part of the assemblage. And also, like in at Ionis uh, assemblies, we see like wild animals, including a lot of hair bones. So it means people consumed consumed hair, and also a lot of bird bone birds. So mostly goose and geese and swans but also some other terrestrial and also aquatic birds. And most of, the, most of these birds are still like present uh, in one region. And also like, you know, in one uh, plain and marsh area, it's still also like part uh, important uh, sanctuary in important place for migratory birds. So at Ionis, uh, in Ionis assemblies also, we found migratory birds. So with uh, all of these aspects also uh, together, uh, so like ancient, geo ancient uh, ecology, and also people's normal hunting and consumption habit, and also, like local ecology and also like some questions like comparing with other sites. For example, at Bastam, they found a huge, uh, large piles of bones deposited into rooms. So these are called bone rooms. So it means you did a lot of you did ritual sacrifice, then you piled all the bones and then burned, like a, like hugely burned. So it was ex uh, explained like these these bones were kind of uh, uh, like sacred objects after the rituals, and then they were deposited into sacred rooms. But later, somehow the citadel, the pal uh, the castle was burnt, and then in that time, like. Yeah, the bones were burnt because in that time, uh, in, in at Boston also, there were like 
three, four dogs. These were guard dogs. Guard dogs, they were like uh, uh, guarding these bones. And then when the citadel or the, the castle was burnt, these guard dogs, they were also died. Uh, and uh, we, we found like this kind of content. But at Ionis, we see like this kind of burnt bones. We don't find like huge pile of burnt bones or like accumulated bones. So some, some bones were burnt. So it means these bones weren't actually accumulated at one time or like with a large pile of bones. Uh, it was like slowly, slowly at a regular basis. So through time, they were like accumulated. Uh, until 1.5 meters, like thick. So it means like in upper layer, when there was a fire at the end of the period or end of the occupation, we see like some part was burnt. So, uh, so it wasn't like likely that this was systematically deposited as a uh, sacred or ritual object. So it was like slowly, slowly, like, so, and some other prospects also, like when we see these cut marks, so look at it when you, so this is also iron site, but this is a sheep skull, like sliced half from the middle. So this is a pelvis bone of a sheep, like sliced inside. And also this is a, humerus arm bone of a cattle sliced half. But when we see other ironic sites, for example, at Alaybe Hoyuk, we see also sliced, but this wasn't like so professional, like sliced half of a skull as at Ionis. So this is also very like striking information. Like, yeah, they have really professional butchering skill, butchering practice at this at the site. So, and there's another aspect is like, like here is sliced half of skull the same way. So there are, I mean, we, I didn't, I mean, encounter this much skull sliced inside, sliced half. So as it like, they just put the skull and they sliced half. So this kind of striking, information like um, wild bones, like uh, uh, bones, uh, bones of wild animals, bones of uh, birds, uh, fish bones, and also like contextual burnt bones, and also like uh, butchering marks, and also these pathological marks, and also this uh, kind of some particular uh, bones with particular uh, way of uh, slicing. This kind of striking information actually uh, can give us really, really crucial information uh, related to ancient environment, related to uh, uh, like uh, uh, local subsistence, and also give us opportunity to compare with other sites, other region. So when we see this kind of uh, uh, background or this kind of uh, context, uh, easily we can understand like if any site actually a zooarchaeologist go and then at any site with really good archeological context, if they, study uh, faunal remains, we can find um, crucial archeological answers for this subject. For example, if just general uh, faunal assemblies, we just in overall, if we study uh, from cultural, uh, from one period to another period, from one study graphy to another study graphy, we can see economical change or from a bronze side, we, if we compare uh, with a bronze side to an iron side, we can see the dimension or changes in economical practice. 
uh, economical um, uh, changes and also like certain period, certain time, as you said, like good example is the pig bombs, for example. So like political, religious change, when a new administrative power, new religious power comes, occupy a site, and then with a, with a period, with a certain period, like what kind of political, what kind of religious changes came, we can see from a general tonal assemblies. And also, like at site like um, Ionis, is is difficult. But at Ionis, we can see the higher class people, Ionis citadel, the life and also the subsistence and the behavior practices of um, higher class people. And at a time in outer town, or also at site like Alaybe, we can see the ordinary life. So for example, we see people were eating dog meat uh, in that time, which was really, it's, it's difficult to find the written records. And also, of course, paleo ecology, environmental change, like what kind of animals were available in that time. Now, what kind of animals is extinct? Why they are extinct? What was the cause? Because of the environment or because of the human action? So similarly, for if we do the analytical research, so, so look at like when we see the morphological changes like at Alaybe, like 500 years later at Ionis, what, what is the like size differences of animals? So at Ionis, we see large animals, even larger sheep, sheep larger than wild sheep. So what is the function? So, and also like genetic variations, paleopathology, like analytical research are really, really very scopes, uh, like I mean, possible to there. And also when we see the broader geoarchaeological questions or local questions, like when we see like in this Eastern Turkey, after the Bronze Age, we see like human, there were like human, human impact in that area. Like there were like forest and forest were burnt away. We see like in Elazi region in um, a colleague, they recently published a wonderful research there. Like in uh, Lake Hazar, uh, uh, you have the stratigraphy, and then in, the, in this stratigraphy, you see like the impact or reduce of pollen. So it means like human, they deforest, they were because of human impact, there was like deforestification. And because of this, like, yeah. So before the Bronze Age, like Eastern Turkey wasn't the geography or the uh, environment wasn't controlled by human that much. But during the time of Bronze Age, uh, the, the in favor of metal and also human impact. So environmental, there were catastrophe or environmental pressure. So like same changes we can see from animal remains uh, from Bronze Age to Iron Age. And also the impact of local environment, local, local climate due to due to the livestock economy and also people's movement, like from one region to another area with the livestock, how people moved. And also, as I said, like what, what, was, what was the consequence? Like now, when you go to Eastern Turkey, um, kind of um, uh, like part of, I mean, in Ban region, you don't have like forest or vegetation, but in, uh, like some part, for example, in Elazi region, you have forest, but these forests are a small, small forest. It's not like big natural forest. So was it, for example, there's a very wonderful case in Eastern uh, Central Turkey. Like now Central Turkey is a kind of barren area because of overgrazing. After the Neolithic people used a lot of livestock and then because of this naturally forest in the hill and mountainous area couldn't grow. And because of this permanently Eastern Turkey, uh, Central Turkey, I mean, or uh, Central Anatolia now became because of lack of like drought, uh, uh, the, the affected by drought, affected by severe like uh, catastrophe uh, because of the overgrazing. So was it happened in Eastern Turkey also because of this? So like this kind of broader regional and 
broader archaeological questions also possible to study from Kuna remains in Eastern Turkey. Uh, the case of iron is actually showed us. So what's the problem? Why? Like, as we said, like zoo archaeology, uh, so we see like in Kevan project, we have some, we have some zoo archaeological project and some good zoo archaeologists also came here. Uh, but later, like for uh, later 50 years, we don't see like analytical. So when we see zoo archaeological study in Western Turkey, Central Turkey, in Southeastern Turkey, but in Eastern Turkey, we don't see analytical zoo archaeological research. Why? What's the problem? So the, I mean, in this is my comments or my my my realization uh, for working for six years in this region. So one is like um, when you, when our colleagues, they do the archeological excavation there. So when in that excavation, like zoo archeology span doesn't come forward as a like emergency or uh, unavoidable source. So their first priority, they don't put on priority on the zoo archeology or archeobotany. They first priority, priority, they give priority on, I mean, what I see mostly on like lithics or metal or ceramics, actually, most prominently. Later, this kind of subject came as archaeological questions because it's a commonly, commonly like, uh, like kind of generalization that zoo archaeology or archaeobotany. It's like biologist work. It's not archaeologist work. And because of this, when an archaeology archaeologist make a plan for archaeological project, they make plan on like artifacts. Artifacts is like pottery, like metal, or like this. So they don't see animal bones as artifact value. So that's why they leave it to the biologist work. So that's why they came the secondary work. Another is like yeah, biologist, and because of this sense like kind of anthropology, anthropologists with biological background or veterinary people, they come and then they zoo archaeology. And then they, I mean, unfortunately, uh, the lack of the contextualization of archaeological context. And th that's why this kind of work actually become kind of report, biological report or veterinary report kind of things. And that's why, I mean, particularly archaeology students, they also don't encourage to be a uh, zoo archaeologist because they think this is veterinary work or this is a uh, biologist work. But in fact, this is primarily archaeologist work. Who is doing biology from archaeological side? So when a biologist comes, they do the biological perspective, then they lack the archaeological context and then it becomes a biological report. So. So we don't find archaeological answer of, of the archaeological questions. And also, uh, this is very, very crucial due to varieties of factors. Uh, there are multi-team collaboration, lack of multi-team collaboration. For example, one side doesn't collaborate with other sites or one researcher doesn't collaboration. So there are varieties of reasons. So maybe lack, lack of confidence, lack of sharing, lack of funding and other things. But at a time, uh, yeah, if we if we compare Eastern Turkey with Southeastern Turkey, Central Turkey, we see like in Eastern Turkey there are really wonderful sites from when like human impact started uh, on the planet. So particularly Calcolithic and also Bronze Age, there are really really well preserved sites in Eastern Turkey. And also archaeological materials, particularly bone remains, are really, really well preserved in these sites. And then, really, as I showed a little bit ago, like there are important research questions, like at the archaeological site. Yeah, certain people were uh, use this site, but what was the relationship with the environment? What was the real impact of human impact in this region? And how can we? solve or what how can we uh, um, solve this these problems or like in which behavior human behavior actually made 
the landscape or the environmental catastrophe or what for example at Alai Bay Hoyok um, we found uh, we found beaver but beaver is uh, extinct in eastern Turkey for long period so if uh, um, if um, uh, biodiversity researcher or if um, a Ministry of Environment or they want to introduce beaver like what, what happened in northern Europe, uh, zoological evidence says, yeah, it's possible because beaver was leaving, beavers were leaving in Eastern Turkey uh, in archaeological period. So it's possible this is their natural habitat so they can survive if they are introduced. And the same way, for example, uh, like we see like for 6,000 years, so at our archeological sites. So for example, at Alaybi, we see like over 50, 45, 50% of bones are from cattle. It means cattle, how cattle are supplying 80%, 90% of meat supply from Eastern Turkey or from for all over Turkey, same way. Cattle were actually really, really dominated in Eastern Turkey for five, six years, thousand years. So with this uh, information, with this archeological uh, data, also we can give, give the background or foundation of more sustainable work, kind of like introducing local breeds, introducing um, like um, uh, uh, introducing profitable, economically profitable animals Carol, Excuse like, me, uh, Doctor Sudik. Uh, sorry, we um, we are running. Yeah, I'm almost time. done. Please, I'm almost can done we wrap that. up? Yes, please. Thank yes, you. I'm almost sorry. done. Yeah. So this is the this is the scope. Yeah, so, of course. It's very it's interesting, so, but this time is important. Thank you. So, so, thank you. So, for example, nowadays in Turkey you have meat crisis. So the um, the pr price of meat is increasing the pastoralism is uh, facing really great challenge but if we if we think about like eastern turkey so here archaeological evidence says like like cattle are really really suitable for this disease area and sheep uh, are suitable for this disease area like this kind of so with this uh, greater and very important research questions and we we really really uh, have scopes for good collaborations for national and international collaboration. So uh, so this is my lab, and also here I have also materials from Eastern Turkey, and also last year also there were collaborators came came from. So he's uh, Haskell Greenfield, one of the prominent zoologists from Canada, and also we are thinking to do collaboration. So this is my friend from. Germany. She's actually from England, but now she's working at Max Planck Institute. And this is another friend from Russia. So there's some other colleagues also they are doing collaboration. So same way in Eastern Turkey, what I said, well-preserved archaeological sites, well-preserved archaeological assemblies, zonal assemblies, and really, really crucial local and regional questions. This is really very important. And also, uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, this is really, really, uh, uh, uh, Eastern Turkey really, really has some, yeah, cru uh, potentials to do zooarchaeology. So future, co I mean, our colleagues and also our students, particularly archaeology students, they, they can think about for their future career. And also when our colleagues, when they do zooarchaeological project, they also, I mean, can consider zooarchaeology as a potential subfield, I mean, to to answer very important unanswered archaeological questions. So I'd like to thank uh, Arwa for inviting me to give uh, like to, to, to give scope to share my general view of Zuarkelu, the potential of Zuarkelu of Eastern Tur in Eastern Turkey. And also my university, Artukli University, uh, Minister of Culture and Tourism, and also um, the IANIS team to give me support and scopes for doing like zoarchaeological study in Eastern Turkey. And in particular, I owe my 
acknowledgement and gratefulness to Professor Os uh, Professor Mehmet Ishikli. Actually, he first invited me to study zooarchaeology in Eastern Turkey. And because of him, I started working. And for six years, I've been working. And hopefully, I will continue. And thank you, uh, Professor Ishikli. And thank you all for your uh, kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siddiq. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative and uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think there is so much uh, for us, I mean, archaeologists, to learn uh, scope or within the framework of the animal, uh, human, and environment uh, relationship. Uh, I realized at this uh, at the end of this presentation. Thank you again. I am sure there will be uh, questions and comments uh, from the, our participants. Also, I have uh, already seen and raised uh, hand. Uh, first of all, I think uh, Mariam Hanum. Can you hear me, yes. Mariam? Yes, can you hear me too, sir? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, we are listening to your comments or your question. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Abu, uh, it was very interesting. And you know that it's always interesting topic for me uh, among all the things in Ionis. And we talked with uh, you and of course with Vedat, but there there are only some some very um, small details that you know um, always come to my mind about this this area in Ionis. Uh, well, you think that this is the waste and um, the debris of all, everything was uh, you know in there, and uh, there was no architectural context. Therefore, this is debris and. In, in, in this situation, the bulla are not related to bones. Uh, so this is unlike Bastan, that the bones are uh, directly related to the bulla. Uh, then there is only one dog that seems to be the watchdog because only one dog is, is found. I, I do not know, I, I just suppose that. Uh, like Bastan, that there are three dogs. Uh, and of course, you think that these are corpse and not the bones. Uh, you mean these are the bones with meat, not not what you can see in Bastan. But are they are not all always eatable because because there are um, among them are animals that may not consume for the meat, or as you mentioned yourself, the age of these uh, animals are, are um, sometimes uh, a little bit confusing. So are you now quite sure that this is not a bone room mm -hmm. and only the place for the breeze? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Well, I mean, it's always uh, really nice to discuss with you. We will discuss these things again because I have also so many questions uh, and, and also I have to learn uh, know some uh, crucial information from you too because sharing I, I remember we I was discussing about Bula uh, uh, in Van and then yeah it was really really enlightening and then because of this uh, yeah my perception perception also changing it is good so this is uh, that this is why it's important to do multidisciplinary work sure uh, so why I'm, I mean, for now, I'm saying this uh, debris because um, you see not only bulla, not only bones, there are also other artifacts. And these artifacts are discarded artifacts. So the most important evidence is potsherds. So, so you have potsherds, unvaluable, I mean, not valuable potsherds, and also like waste. And also when you see bulla and other objects, these are kind of, Kind of, kind of like lost their, you know, functions. And mm -hmm. for bones, so uh, like dogs, so we don't see whole dog com dog skeleton. So in Boston, we see three dogs. So these dogs are whole complete dogs. But at Ionis, we only one bone from here. So this is one. This is this Atlas bone, and this is one bone. It can be. So you see, Ionis was like occupied for fifty years, less the highest. So it can be de deposited, accumulated. One single dog bone can be, you know. And also, uh, but there is another thing. Like last year, we found. Uh, I mean, last year of study, I found a, a pow, 
pow of a beer, beer pow, only one, but it is totally burned black. So what's the function of only one pow? Not whole pow, only one nail of, mm -hmm. of, of a beer. So like the, that's why uh, when we solve or when we discuss with major question and big question, so this one single bone or one single specimen doesn't answer this at all. So, but when you see like, um, uh, like, like, so if this is, a, let's say, if this is a sacred deposit, so what's the function of rabbit here? If this is a sacred deposit, for example, let's say, what's the function of fish bones here? What's the function function of um, bird bird bones here? And also varieties of birds, for example. You have raptors and you have also terrestrial birds. You have also aquatic birds. Yeah, so, sorry also, to interrupt you, but, but uh, we are not quite sure that Assam bone rooms are, I mean, the bones were for sacred um, ritual. This is only one um, speculation that maybe they are for sacred um, ritual or something. It's, it, it doesn't mean that um, they are, we are quite sure that they are sacred. And in Bastan, we have so many animals that are totally, not related to totally, the at totally all. agree with you. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. That's the point. That's the point. I totally agree with you. And that's why I say, surely it's a temple complex and then it's an enigmatic temple complex. And surely this is related to royal residents, elite people. And surely there were animal sacrifice. There were like this. But these bones were not 100% all sacrificial waste. That, that was my point. That's why I said there were occasional, at least, of course. And so that's why I didn't say like there wasn't any animal sacrifice at the site. I definitely say the, there were, I mean, these bones and their percentage, their size and their sex, all rip, all says like that this was selectively selected animals, selectively butchered, selectively killed animals. So it wasn't like randomly, okay, I am hungry, let's find an animal, so whatever animals, and then you kill it. So this is normal. So in this preference, elite people, they should eat delicious meat, like small animals. But here in this case, no. So we find a mixture of things. It means people also, it's what consumption waste and also it was ritual waste. So that's why I said there was, if there wasn't like a, a regular animal sacrifice, at least like large bulls, large big animals, at least they say it's occasional sacrifice. This is my, I mean, for now, uh, what do you care? Initial conclusion, let's say. But in future, I mean, there will be more, I mean, studied, and then we'll find more concrete answer. But for now, this is my primary conclusion that, yeah, there were animal sacrifices at the, at the site, but the bones doesn't say like all were like and sacrificial animals. It means people also consumed. It, it was consumption also, consumption waste. This is my hypothesis for now. Thank you so much, Abu. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam, for your question and uh, thank you for your reply. And uh, the second one is uh, dear Ali. Ali, we are listening. Uh, thank you. It was a great presentation. Um, some of the points that I wanted to raise, uh, they, they were raised by uh, Mariam Dara. But, um, <laughs> I want to make a few points. I I, uh, I studied obviously not the, I myself I never worked with the bone, uh, but in case of Bastam, there is an uh, architecture. Uh, the animals' bones are uh, kind of they lack their feet and the, the scales are lack, so they don't have the uh, scales and uh, feet. I think in in in Ayans there are, as you showed, if I'm not making mistakes, and also. If you are going to uh, associate it with the rituals, uh, I was just checking uh, what it was said by Alta and Chilingirolo. If I, th I believe that they found some animal bones in a temples complex, and I mean, if you are to associate this assemblage with the ritual, how would you consider the, this material within the temple complex itself? And on other point, few other points, I believe, if I'm not making mistakes, there are pig bones from Bastam, from Horom, from Karmibulur, from 
Kar Karagündüz from Büyüktepe even. So obviously Büyüktepe is an iron age, not an Urartian site, but um, I might get your point that the pig bones are not among the, this assemblage, but it is within the uh, lower complex of Ionis. So the, the, I think you are, uh, it will be better if you consider like a site like site of Horam and other sites and they will give you much more uh, broad perspective rather than just selecting few site in Eastern Anatolia. Bones, definitely there are bone, uh, pig bones from the other side, whether they are royal residents or not, I'm not sure on that, but the, the pig's bones are uh, exist and it is interesting to hear obviously that they're not there. I'm, I'm, and also, if I'm not making a mistake again, uh, the lower, I am lower towns, a uh, bone assemblage were supposed to be published by someone in Zimovsky's teams. I believe they never done it. Probably Professor Mehmet Ashikla will have more on that. But I mean, if these are, the, my main point is, if you are associated with this assemblage with the ritual, how would you consider the, the one that within the temple complex themselves, which we know that there were animal bones in the uh, temple complex? Thank you. You're welcome, Ojam. Thank you. So here I found your uh, four aspects you said. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? It's a wonder, wonderful point. Okay, so let me, um, uh, like, yeah, you said something also. I also just elaborate or kind of, kind of, what is the, um, yeah, I will add on your comments, just this. Um, but first, uh, you see, this is the region that we see potential of Zoarchulus in Eastern Turkey. And this kind of factor you don't find in Zoarchulus report. Yeah, there are Zoarchulus reports, but you don't find this kind of aspects discussion. You don't find this kind of this kind of discussion in Zoarchulus report. Why? The problem is, unfortunately, most are done by colleagues without archaeological backgrounds. And that's why they miss archaeological context, archaeological question. So the, the purpose of this uh, discussion was like potential of Zwerkulus in Eastern Turkey. So I brought a case as Ionis to show like you see how potential is it. So yeah, that's true. Um, I saw the report. Uh, in Bastam and other areas also, we don't find uh, like this kind of non-meat-bearing part like skull and also phalanges this much, what we see at INS. So that's why I said like, yeah, these animals were discarded at this, uh, and also slaughtered on site because without slaughtering on site, you don't like like this. If you, if you had slaughterhouse outside, you just throw the non-meat-bearing things and then you just bring maybe a brain, if you consume brain, you bring brain and also meat and other things. And then you just discard the non-meat non bearing things there. So what you see, you find like bones with meat, but at Ionis we see whole things. So it means like the animals were slaughtered. So the question is, were they slaughtered for sacrifice or like butchering things? So then the temple complex, as you said, it comes, yeah. Even in, in my present study, you see like in Temple Coptic, we find a handful of bones. So these are like, you know, irregular, not like accommodation, accumulation of bones. It's like one or two in total, maybe 100, 200 bones in total, like in 30 years of excavation. So it doesn't like show like, yeah, these were part of the temple activities. Uh, but for, and so that's why like uh, I, I, for now, I, I, I give my primary, you know, uh, understanding as uh, I mean, as, as I discussed with Mariam a little bit ago, regarding pig pig bones. Yes, of course. Uh, that's the question. Like, yeah, there were pig bones during the Urartian time, and even there were pig bones in lower city of Ionis in the in their even Zimnaski's uh, normal report and other uh, normal uh, uh, writings, archaeological writings, and also unpublished report. And there are pig bones in Bastam. 
but as I, I didn't see as, as like Harom and other sites, but what I see, I mean, and also like in Iranist time in Eastern Turkey, like as I explained, uh, uh, showed in, uh, in Alaya Bay and also some other sites. Yeah, everywhere you have pigments, but in royal residence area or temple complex on temple site, like Ionis Citadel or in Bastan Citadel area, there wasn't a single pig bone. So then the question comes, why? Why you have pig bones in lower city, but you don't pig bones where the priest or ritual activities occur, being occurred? Or why you don't see pig bones where like, you know, like higher class people are living? Then the question comes, that then I question to archeologist, was the pig taboo? to, to uh, uh, European religion. So, so like, yeah, this is the issue actually. And, and that, that actually, again, shows the potential of zooarchaeology in archeological research in Eastern Turkey. And regarding Jim, Jimnaski's um, uh, team's work, yeah, so in lower town, it was uh, excavated by um, uh, Elizabeth Stone. And then Elizabeth Stone sent these bones to uh, Melinda Zadar. So Melinda Zadar is one of the leading zoologists in the world now. And she's a very respected person. So I contacted with her. And then she said, yeah, these bones actually was sent to my lab and then studied by two Turkish students. I didn't study this because I was really, really delighted. If Melinda really studied this, it would be really nice because yeah, we would, we would find so much insight, so much information from her. So what we find information from Boston, for example, because there, uh, Bosnik actually studied this. That's why we find really elaborate information there. Uh, so they are really, they, they studied with whole archeological contextual perspective. But unfortunately, Melinda said, yeah, they, they came here, they studied, but uh, I don't know if they are published or not. I don't have any idea like this. So I have an un unpublished report, like three, four pages. Like, yeah, as I said, um, yeah, I don't know why this is happening, but 5,000 bones, somebody studies, and they say 3% sheep, 3% goat, this and that. But there's no relationship with archaeological context. There's no relationship because... And my assumption is like, yeah, uh, so yeah, one is, one thing is like this is established, like this kind of, these are biologist work, <laughs> it's not archeologist work. And that's why like, yeah, yeah. And, and that's why uh, even archeology students, they're not encouraged to do these things. They think, yeah, I have to learn biology to do this. But first you have to learn archeology to do this. And that's why, yeah. And, and, and also, I mean, to add your question. So for example, there I study, in uh, Alton, uh, in Yonja Tepe, for example, the size of a, the study, the size of a, size of a fox or size of a dog like this. What's the relationship with the people there? What's the relationship of this size? Nothing. Like veterinary perspective, biological perspective, no archeological questions there, but these are archeological materials. So, I mean, the only thing um, my realization is uh, no archaeological research question is being followed or archaeological context is being followed when studying these things. Because the purpose of these object, um, biological objects is to find archaeological questions, not the biological data, producing biological data. The purpose of, the, the purpose of producing biological data is to give insight to archaeological questions. And either from archaeological site or from zooarchaeological site, actually we find these kind of yeah little leggings. But yeah, Eastern Turkey is really really a potential area to to to to do this. Thank you, Doctor Siddiq. Uh, any question? Ali? Maybe he, Ali I, I mean, wants to say something. Maybe but perhaps to uh, I don't want to keep it too long. Uh, there is a, there yes, should... please, because time is running up. Yeah, yeah, there is a good yeah. there is a good research on Karmir Bulur. There is on good research on Armavir. Uh, I mean, you can access them or Horom. If you're if you're talking to Middle Iron Age and Urartian context, you could you could look at on them that, uh, compare the result. I would, I mean, I would uh, definitely definitely. I have Karmir Bulur, but this is in Russian. That's why it was difficult for me to 
uh, I have covered bullet, but it was difficult. But I say I saw it part by part. But I'm still studying, Hojam. I'm still studying. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Your answer now, uh, Mr. I'll be in touch with you, Hojam. <laughs> Can you hear me, Mr. Bland yeah. Pasharan? Yes, I can hear you that. Thank you. Yes, please. Your question. Um, first of all, I uh, I thank you for the uh, quite quite good uh, recitation. Actually, it was really nice. Uh, I have a similar question, like Mariam, uh, Miss Miss Mariam, because um, your explanation is a bit uh, clouded. <laughs> Is it a ritual? Ritually, the the sheep being culled in that area, or is it for the consumption? I couldn't understand. From I, your hypothesis is a bit of both. It's it's not a scientific result. It is, isn't it? So uh, as we know that in that area, uh, the the sheep being culled, twenty nine percent of underage one one year and 17% uh, uh, first year, 21% second year, and three, four years, 24, which is the quite similar taste of that Anatolian peoples still eat in that area. I mean, we, we love the taste of the lamb as well as we love the taste of the sheep. So, so that's, more like it's not for the sacrificial it's not for the ritual it's more like a consumption area that and the other thing is your explanation you're saying that oh it's the the higher rank people area we couldn't find the uh, um, pork bones of course it's been clean that area is should, i mean it's quite logical it's you you you don't you're not gonna keep the um, that animal near the king, isn't it? You know it's it's quite logical. That area you found it. Funny enough, you have you said that one bone of the dog. I I couldn't understand the atlas bone of the dog is unbelievably nice shape. Maybe it's for the luck somebody kept it. So you don't know the uh, if it is a dog. Even, I don't know, I'm, I, I have a doubt about it. You have done the DNA test for the, is it a wolf or a dog? We don't know it because except from the DNA test, the, everything gonna be exactly the same bone, same uh, construction anyway. So uh, how did you find out? I don't understand. So it is, one other thing is, was the pig taboo? That is, <laughs> that is quite, it's not the, it's not the, is it the result of your, uh, your uh, uh, work? Do you think that there was no pork? Maybe you couldn't reach that po uh, po uh, pig bones yet. Maybe there was. <laughs> so it's, it's still, it's not, it's very blurry uh, picture you have, you have give us. And indeed, indeed. One, one more thing is uh, I find quite hypocritical because when you said that veterinarians cannot give a, a bioarchaeological -arch report, uh, then you question that um, I start questioning your multidisciplinary work, uh, research ability, because uh, you complaining about the veterinarians? They they cannot give a biological bio um, biological report. Then you working with Professor Vedat. This is hold on a minute. You know, it's quite hypocritical uh, uh, say uh, to say that. So it's I really uh, and that criticizing is not really good on your uh, report, I guess. Uh, but overall. It was a good, a good research. I really like to listen to that. Uh, but how about the pork? Uh, maybe they don't like the taste of it. I mean, you can't say if it is a taboo. We don't know it. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. So, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for, for pointing out this. So, yeah, some of things. Um, so, okay, first uh, discuss like hypocritical things because this is offensive. So 
that the issue is I'm really, really very politely saying, I didn't say veterinary cannot do this. I said, when you, for example, I'm an archaeologist, I study veterinary, this, let's say. And if I want to solve the veterinary questions in archaeological way, I cannot solve it. Can I? Anybody can this study. The problem is like, when you want to solve an archaeological questions with veterinary aspects, then you cannot solve it. It's very simple. There is no objection here. That was my general point. It wasn't criticizing anybody. So for example, let's say I said in Boston, there was a good work. So Bosnick, he was from veterinary. She was from veterinary, but she discussed this in archeological context, context. So I'm just, I didn't say like whether that was from veterinary. So I'm criticizing him, not like this. So there are other colleagues, they came from anthropology. Some came from archeology span maybe, I don't know. But the pro problem is when you discuss, when you, analyze an archaeological assemblage in veterinary aspects or biological aspects or let's say ecological aspects, then you don't find the answer of archaeological questions. That was the actual general things. So for example, the good example is let's say ionist, let's say. If I publish this in at ionist five percent, like as I said, like this and this that. And then I said, yeah, this is the zoarchological report. So that's gonna work. That's not gonna work. But if I, if I question like what you questioned, what was the peak? Peak was really taboo or like, what was the relationship with uh, this temple? Then it become archeological question. Then you have problem. This is one thing. And I, so, so there's no here, but my point was when you, when I do archeological assemblies, I have to contextualize this with archaeological, like as you said, like uh, archaeological findings, context, their um, what do you call um, arch architecture, and also the period, their belief and symbolism. And with this contextual as analysis, then I can find find or answer for archaeological question. So it's very simple. There wasn't any hypocritical things or criticizing anybody else. Uh, regarding pig, so here is the thing, like for when I studied Ionis, I also said many times to Professor Ishikri also, here, it came more questions than the answers. Because, uh, I mean, there are many questions actually arrived from this study. That questions weren't actually before. But after this study, we found this kind of, for example, this question was peak taboo. I think nobody maybe didn't ask this question before. And for example, maybe, maybe it's not the, about the maybe. So for example, we can say like, um, without any evidence, maybe uh, King Rusha got married to five people, five women, for example, we can say, or maybe, but, but there isn't any evidence there. In future, maybe there could be an epic, uh, an inscription. This says, yeah, not only like this, maybe there are other like, but but for now, the, the text says, Rusha got married to one lady and, and, and, and he established this Ionist temple or, or maybe there was some, I mean, she, her, uh, his wife was living here because we find archaeological evidence in the name of Rusa's wife. So it means she was Rusa's, Rusa's wife. So pig here, what I say, we see pig outer town, we see pig in other sites, we see pig in, um, in Bastam in lower town, but we don't see pig in citadel area in Ionis and also in Bastam. And where, where are, um, who, are the, who are living in this uh, citadel? Of course, elite people. So then the question comes, we don't know. We don't know because there's no written things. So then the question, was it taboo? Why their lack of things? Of course, in future, when we find new evidence, so then we will answer this question. And, and the last comes the first question <laughs> from you, thank you, is the sacrifice. Sacrifice is really, really, really very difficult issue in zoarchaeology. And it's impossible to understand. Even we, we, when you have slice marks, cut marks in atlas and axis, 
you cannot say this is the this is the product of this is the product of sacrifice unless there is a small sacrificial pit and they say yeah written record yeah there was like there was like sacrifice and then these bones were deposited like this only few very few examples around the world even in turkey so uh, i there's a group zoarchaeology group we have we have discussions there last year there was a very great debate about sacrificial sacrifice in zoarchaeology like this so it was really really true so that's why i we know this is a temple site and this temple is really really an enigmatic temple and the temple was built in the name of haldi and the haldi was the god who i mean by name with with his name most animals were sacrificed in urartian world and then we see this is a temple site this is a royal site and we see selected animals of course it could that's why i said yeah so we know we this is possible for example another thing is like you have very large bull very very big bull why we should bring very big bull and and 63% of course only few bone we could like section but 63% were like female so so so so these questions actually points yeah at least at least it's it's like it gives you proof that at least there was sacrifice but were all the animals were sacrificed there no we cannot say this because we see this and that this and that so it means there were consumption that's why i said yeah this is the most secure way but nobody can can give you the exactly 100% answer like yeah this was all sacrifice or this was was consumption so that's why i uh, left these questions to archaeologists or future zoo archaeologists who who is going to work on this question in future or we, we will work on this future so that we can bring new new answers Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siddiq. Uh, your, your comments and your answers. Now, uh, the next one is Professor Rainer Chizon is here. Uh, how are you, Rainer? Thank you, fine. How are you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, attending to your um, uh, presentation. Yeah, dear, yes, we are listening to your question. Dear colleague, uh, dear Abu Sadiq, thank you very much for your inspiring uh, lecture, in in my opinion, uh, pigs were highly recommended in the in the prehistoric periods because they were an easy access to oil. But from the uh, middle and late Bronze Age periods onwards, uh, plant oils became more, more popular, uh, as we can learn from the texts, and uh, we can also learn from the text that at that time, pigs started to to run in the streets of the cities and to eat the garbage. And they were therefore negatively connoted. Yeah? Uh, pigs were seen as, as garbage eaters. So that may be the reason why this royal uh, class uh, doesn't want to be connected with, with pork. They, they prefer, preferred to eat cleaner, um, cleaner animals. So maybe, this uh, taboo was not a religious uh, taboo like in modern times. It was uh, a taboo of yeah of of clean of cleanliness um, in a way. And um, I have a, a second question. Um, I was I studied zooarchaeology as a minor subject in in Munich uh, thirty years ago at Professor Bersnack and Professor von den Drisch. And what I uh, what stays in my mind that they had a huge collection of comparison uh, bones for comparison. Do you have a, a similar collection of bones in in your in institute? I, I, I suppose you have, but can you uh, explain that a little bit, please, to us? Thank you. So yeah, yeah. This is a uh, uh, thank you so much for enlightening this. Yeah, actually, uh, in Iron Age, for example, I'm working in another site is Bayrakli Huyuk in Western Turkey, in Izmir. And there, I studied like uh, two years uh, for now, so I'm, I'm going to study. So until now, I see peaks are about 30% of assembly there. So for example, at Alaybeyi Huyuk, I see peaks, so it means people are 
uh, raising pigs. So pigs about 13 to 15 percent of pigs. So for example, people consumed animal. I mean, out of the assemblers, 13 percent, and in uh, Western Turkey, 37 percent. So you see high amount. So yeah, but yeah, this is a very important important information. Like yeah, as a textual evidence says, like yeah, pigs were regarded as dirty animals, not like for and you know elite people like in ottoman period uh, like chicken chicken were like kind of exotic and the kind of you know rich people's food uh, uh, so yeah yeah this is a good point thank you uh, for comparative collection sure um, yeah without a comparative comparative collection we cannot do zoo archaeology <laughs> it's not possible so I'm, i've been working in mardin is uh, 6 years only so in 6 years you cannot like um, uh, uh, collect like a uh, uh, very rich reference collection, but yeah, enough. I have, uh, mm, yeah, in my, I, I showed you the, I established, this is newly, I established new lab and yeah, struggling. So yeah, and, and also I, I, I came from archaeology uh, background. So, so yeah, so yeah, but I have uh, reference collections, uh, uh, uh, birds, mammals, and also fish. Yeah, and also I'm building up time to time. <laughs> it's okay. Dr. Sadiq is finished. Okay, thank you very much. And now uh, Maryam uh, also wants to add uh, one point shortly, please, <laughs> Maryam. Yeah, are... really shortly. Uh, it just came to my mind that there is not a single mentioning of pig tribute in the inscriptions as, as, as far as I remember. So maybe this is not to do anything with, with taboo or something like that, but just the preference of, of consumption because all the tributes were not going for royal family and, and the, um, um, um, the citadel. So perhaps this is only the preference of consumption, not, not to go with being taboo this much. I, I just, just, just uh, suggest that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is also comes uh, to Mr. Bullen's question. As I said, like, as a archaeologist and also archaeologist, I studied this and then this um, enigma actually came to my mind. And then, but, but I cannot answer this. Uh, this is uh, like our, it's a holistic question. It's a great question. And then we should answer this uh, collectively. So that's why I like put forward this question so that yeah other colleagues as you said like epigrapher and also archaeologist paleographer and also other people all together we can solve this yeah in future yeah maybe you will give us some clue who knows <laughs> so that we can answer this question <laughs> yeah thank you again uh, also last uh, one is uh, Vedat, uh, our uh, team member of the ANS excavation. Also, uh, Abu and Vedat work working together at the ANS project. Has uh, he has a question? Uh, maybe you can see the chat box. He wrote the chat box. Can you read the uh, Abu, Doctor Sadiq, or I can read? Yeah, yeah, or same. Yeah, yeah. Hojam, I I read this. Thank you. So thank you, Vedat, for this question. As I said, like when I was discussing with uh, Bulent and uh, yeah, actually, yeah, same thing actually, Vedat, you asked. So this is like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm working there for only six years. So I'm not a, a very strong, a good person, or maybe uh, what do you say, authentic person to answer like this. But uh, it was my general realization. In future, maybe I'll learn some more. But in generally, like when you meet the archeological context, and for example, um, only few experts, as you said, like, yeah, thanks to like people like Vedat. And I, yeah, I did collaboration with Vedat. So when I was a PhD student, uh, he was a part of my PhD Zuri. And then we did some collaboration, but uh, in future, I mean, by time to time when I, what I realized like, um, yeah, I don't want to criticize, criticize here, but there's no criticism. Just my point is like, I'm just more of interested in solving archaeological questions than accumulating, you know, biological data. And, and that actually makes uh, difficulties when, yeah, I see reports, but I cannot like, you know, 
uh, find the answer of archaeological questions and also yeah lack of contextual data yeah uh, that's true like uh, in Aslan Tepe as I said Aslan Tepe has been the only site in eastern Turkey with really really in a good sense zoological work they have yeah more than 15 uh, papers there but necessarily that all papers are answering like big big questions but as I said like critical questions, critical regional questions, environmental questions, uh, animal pasteurism questions, actually we can find from Aslan Tepe. But some other sites like uh, Soshuyuk, they published like three, two, three papers. And at IANIS, I published two papers and some other works are being done. Uh, not IANIS, sorry, Alaybe. And in IANIS, yeah, Vedat is also yeah, assisting me, assist, assist me, and then we published a book chapter. Uh, with the uh, yeah under Mehmet Ishikli, and also now uh, we are studying funeral remains. Bedat is also doing PhD there, and hopefully there will be more and more yeah you know elaborate work at Ianis. So same thing actually. I my purpose of this presentation was to point out yeah look, this is the scenario of zooarchaeology, yeah, but there are these these scopes. It's a vast area. And this is the area where, like, I mean, human settlement we see from calculatic period where it's a broader area, as it, uh, as uh, Mr. Bullent and also Professor Reiner say, like when urbanization actually happened, that means when absolute human control over the environment we see. And this is the period where Eastern Turkey was occupied or colonized by really human, uh, really colonized by human. So it means. If we really want to understand the human impact on nature, it's a broader question. Zooarchaeology can be a great tool here. And also if we can solve um, political, environmental, economical change, greater Eastern Turkey, not archeological uh, facts like pottery or architecture cannot, or metal cannot answer this because people, hundred I mean, 90% of their subsistence is based on animals. So we have to study animals, focusing on archaeological question. But if we say, let's say, five fifty percent sheep, fifty percent goat, uh, these kind of things never answer these kind of questions. So yeah, Eastern Turkey has really great resource. As I say, as I showed, like over what, about a hundred site excavated sites. It's a long, yeah. It's not a, a short list. It's a big list. So it means there should be a lot of lot of scopes to do more zoo archaeology there. Yeah, and thank you for your yeah, yeah thank you. wonderful comments and yeah, it will help me in, for doing zoarchaeology in Eastern Turkey in the future. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for uh, everybody. Uh, I realize uh, that we have exceeded our time. Thank you, thank you for your patience, uh, but I think it was very uh, productive and very exciting event. Thank you very much to everyone who contributed. As a result, according to me, Bones still have a lot of stories to tell us. Thank you. Thank you very That's everybody. Okay. I hope to see you next event, two weeks later. Thank you for your attending.